listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to www.nakedbibleblog.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 52, Acts 16 and 17. I'm your layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Good, good. Glad to be back again. Yeah, absolutely. We got two chapters this week. Yeah, we do. Uh, I'm not going to read through the, the full chapters of both. We'll read through most of most of what's there. But again, just picking out a few things that are kind of interesting, at least to me anyway, and hopefully uh, to listeners that pop up in these two chapters. So let's just jump in. We have Acts 16. We'll just start reading at the top. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. So here we get our first introduction to Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Again, these were the places where Paul had run into all sorts of trouble. Of course, he had been stoned. We talked about that last time. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, again, if you think back to last time, the Acts 15 uh, situation where the Jerusalem Council had to meet and how mu- what burdens do we put on uh, Gentile believers and whatnot, circumcision was not one of those. You know, it was very clear in, in terms of the decision that you know, Gentile converts don't have to become Jews to be saved. But Paul, nevertheless, because of, again, really, I think that the places that Timothy is associated with Lystra and Iconium, where he had so much trouble, he does uh, circumcise Timothy. Again, he had not undergone circumcision. The passage doesn't say anything about um, that this resulted in him being a believer or accepted by the disciples. It actually says both of those things prior to his circumcision. He was a disciple, verse 1 says. So he's, he's a believer, son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, well spoken of by the brethren, and again, the other believers at Lystra and Iconium. But Paul, again, sort of, I think, to head off the argument or head off possibly a threat uh, even to Timothy, uh, personal, you know, physical harm, uh, goes ahead and circumcises him. So this is a, a pragmatic thing for Paul to do. It's not a theological thing that he's doing. Verse 4, as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem, the stuff that was decided in Acts 15. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. This is verse 9. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Of course, us, Luke is the writer here, so he's part of the group too. I want to stop here and just make make a few observations. It's kind of interesting that uh, here we have a situation where the Holy Spirit forbids Paul and his companions to preach the gospel in a certain place. Now, we don't really know what Asia means in, in the passage and what What is actually meant by that term isn't clear. Again, it has to do with ancient geography. Uh, Is it some province in Rome? Is it ancient, you know, Asia, you know, further east? Is it? Is it? Could be cities on the Aegean coast that are that this terminology was used of them again in ancient geography. Doesn't really matter. Whatever the locale is, the spirit again prevents them from going there and preaching the gospel. It's contrary to a lot of the missions that you're going to see. We've already seen, and we're going to see in the Book of Acts, where the spirit, you know, initiates where Paul goes. And we actually sort of get the answer to why he's forbidden from going to this one place in verses 9 and 10. Because It's because the Spirit wants him to go to a different place. This Again, he gets this Macedonian call where he gets this vision of a man in Macedonia uh, urging them to come over to Macedonia and preach to them. And that's what they're going to do. And of course, you know, that winds up to be the right thing to do. So here you have a situation. We're not really told how the Spirit forbade them, just that he did. But again, there was part of, of a plan. And so Paul and his companions obey. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is, let me read verse 17 and see what, what kind of stands out as a little little odd or perhaps a significant, maybe it'll ring a bell in, in your ear. We have in verse 7, when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Now, prior to that, the verse prior, we have having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit. 
to speak the word in Asia. And here we're forbidden by the spirit of Jesus. Now, for anybody, again, who's followed my work on uh, the whole concept of a godhead in Israelite religion, and of course, within Judaism, the two powers uh, in heaven uh, teaching, uh, and on into the divine council stuff, perhaps the first draft of of, uh, the book that'll be out imminently, um, used to be called The Myth That Is True. If, If any of you have read the older draft, you know that there's a discussion in there about this language, and that is, just as when you get when you're thinking about the two powers in heaven, again, it used to be orthodox theology in Judaism to have two good powers in heaven, two Yahweh figures. You know, in, in some Jewish texts, you even get the second one referred to as the lesser Yahweh or the second God, that kind of thing. Now, that becomes a heresy right around the beginning of the second century, which not coincidentally coincides with the birth of the early church, the birth of, of biblical Christianity. But Judaism at one time had this idea. So, you know, back in the Old Testament, you would have a, a, a Yahweh figure that was human in form. The angel of the Lord is, is the best example. In, in whom was the name? Again, that's another way of referring to God, Hashem. In whom was the presence, that sort of thing. So as that second figure was, but also wasn't God, that is sort of the backdrop for the way uh, Jesus is presented in the New Testament. Jesus is, but isn't God. He is God. He's, he's, he's really God. He's, he's deity. He has all the attributes of God and all that kind of stuff. But he also isn't because he's not the Father. You know, there, there's still this dissimilarity in this hierarchical relationship. Again, this is how Christians talk when they talk about a Godhead. Again, it's the same sort of thing. But here we have the Spirit brought into the discussion. So just as Jesus is, but also isn't God, in that he's not the Father, the Spirit is, but isn't Jesus. So did you catch that? I mean, the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus are used in parallel here. So is it the Spirit of God or is it the Spirit of Jesus? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, Just like, is it God or is it Jesus? The answer is yes. This is actually where you get Trinitarian theology coming uh, coming from. You don't get Trinitarian theology from pronouns and prepositions and and all this sort of stuff. I mean, uh, that kind of thing helps. uh, But for people who, you know, and you, you get, you know, some of these some, you know, quote unquote teachers in messianic movements or whatever Hebrew roots movements or whatever they're calling themselves now, um, you know, that want to deny uh, Godhead theology, Godhead thinking. And the trajectory they typically use are, you know, the the, the same sort of well-worn paths about words like begotten and firstborn and all that kind of stuff. Those things don't refer to a chronological beginning anyway, but that that's typically the, 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 the tack they take. And what I'm suggesting to you is that isn't really where Trinitarian thinking comes from. Trinitarian thinking comes from this notion of a Godhead that begins in the Old Testament. Two figures, you know, that, that they're both Yahweh, but yet they're both different. You know, they're, they're dissimilar as well as being the same Yahweh of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you get a few passages. Again, you can look this up in my book. It, it's going to be out shortly. Or the Old draft, where you get the Spirit, again, drawn into this discussion, even in the Old Testament. Well, here, because Jesus, again, is is the central figure, Jesus, who is Yahweh in the flesh incarnate, here you have the Spirit spoken of as his Spirit, but it's also God's Spirit. And so you have this third figure emerge more clearly, but still identified as Jesus and as God, because Jesus was identified as God. So you have three figures who are co-equal in terms of God-ness, but yet they also have some sort of hierarchical relationship to them. This is really where you get Trinitarian theology uh, coming from, not, again, some of the things that you might have you know, heard articulated in church and whatnot. In my experience, and I I grew up in a a pretty serious church, um, all the way from youth group to to pulpit ministry, I never, uh, to my memory, ever heard a sermon uh, that discussed the spirit of Jesus or the spirit of Christ language in the New Testament. It occurs four or five places, and how that really is is sort of a major consideration in Trinitarian thinking. Uh, it was just a it was just a gap in knowledge, just a, ja- a, a gap in in the way things were presented. So I'm hoping again to draw your attention to it here, and you can go you know in your Bible look up some cross references and find some other places too where it occurs. But again, this is an important part of. Trinitarian discussion, Godhead discussion, uh, right here in, in Acts 16. So let's just jump down to verse 11, where we have uh, Lydia enter the story. We read, So, Luke writes, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, 
and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia. So they, they get to Macedonian territory. And it was also a Roman colony, Luke points out. And that's going to become important later. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. Now, again, this language takes us back to earlier language in the book of Acts about God-fearers. Again, people who were not Jews but had a, a very high view of the God of Israel and Judaism. So they, depending on the Jewish attitude toward them, they could participate in certain things and not other things. But again, they, they just had a high view of Jewish monotheism and, and, and wanted to, to be part of that. And so they did what they could to be part of that. Again, regardless of, again, it, it just depended on, on the community that they were part of uh, as to how, how much of that they could really participate in. But here we have Lydia, a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. That's verse 14. And after she was baptized... And her household as well. She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So they, they give her the gospel. Again, the Lord opens her heart to pay attention, again, to, to em- embrace what, what Paul's saying, obviously not to reject it or to dismiss it or downplay it. She gets baptized. Again, her household, they go home, you know, her household as well. We're going to get another household baptism situation later in this chapter. That actually gives us more details than this one. But Lydia Lydia, again, becomes a follower of, of, of Jesus. Verse 16, we start to get some trouble, though, uh, in, in uh, Philippi. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. It, it's kind of ironic that you have uh, this woman who is is really possessed by a spirit. She has more clear thinking uh, than a lot of the Jewish authorities that you know are in, in these places. But and that goes back to the Gospels too. It, it's she's she's really on a different plane of awareness when it comes to the spirit world than, than they are. And again, this this the spirit within her understands immediately what's going on here. Now it's interesting. These men are the servants of the Most High God. Draw your attention to Most High. Why is that term significant here? Okay, they're in a, I'll give you a clue. They're in a Gentile city. Okay, they've been you know, directed to go there by the Lord. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. His ministry is about reclaiming the nations. Why is the term most high important? Because of Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the most high divided up the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. Okay, but Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his inheritance. It's this, this terminology, again, most high, doesn't occur that often in the New Testament. Uh, and typically when it does, it, you know, it refer, this is an Old Testament title for the God of Israel, most high. It's a statement of authority and superiority. Uh, and again, if we take the whole Old Testament in consideration, uniqueness of Yahweh of Israel. He is you know, like no other and no other are like him. Okay, he is the most high. He's the one who disinherited the nations. He is the one who has authority over the gods of those nations. Again, all this, again, Deuteronomy 32 worldview theology packed into a title, most high. And, and, and the spirit uses this terminology of these guys who are coming in into hostile turf that is under the dominion of other spirit beings and says, hey, these guys are with the most high God. <laughs> again, it, it, it's, it's a clear declaration of really what, just in one sentence, what's actually going on? Because they are there to displace and to, you know, to disrupt, to displace, uh, to reclaim, again, th- this whole cosmic geographical mindset. Uh, the nations, you know, for the true God and for the kingdom, for this thing we call the church, the circumcision neutral people of God. Uh, that's why they're there. And again, that statement just telegraphs it uh, to, to readers, again, who would have just been familiar, that they would have seen that name and it, all these things would have clicked in their head. So these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed... <laughs> turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Of course, we know the rest of the story. The owners of the girl and the slave girl get mad because, hey, our, you know, we just saw our income disappear because this person can't do what she was doing before. Again, because 
the spirit is gone. Of course, Paul and Silas end up getting thrown into prison. What I want to camp on a little bit here is this this terminology uh, where the, the ESV has, they met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Literally, uh, the Greek text has a, a girl having a python spirit or a python as spirit. Okay? The Greek is pneuma pythona. Now, this it sounds really weird because we associate the term python uh, with, you know, a big, you know, snake. Well, python is a reference, again, in the ancient world to a, to a deity figure, to a specific divinity and specifically one that, that had oracular power. Again, that's where you get this idea of, as, that, that Luke wrote about in Acts 16.16 16, about fortune telling. Uh, python was a, a, a divinity, again, a specific divine being who was sort of conceived of as a snake or a dragon and typically associated with Delphi, uh, which was originally known as Pythia. Uh, so again, that, that's, that's actually where the, the terminology you know, has a more direct association there. But again, the, think of Delphi, what do you think of the Delphic Oracle? Okay, the, and the, the Delphic Oracle wasn't the only oracle associated with Delphi or that region, uh, but you get this specific terminology that, again, people who were reading this in Greek uh, reading their New Testament back in the ancient world, they, they would have known right away Numa Pythona is one of these entities, one of these divine beings, again, the spirit of divination. Now, in Greek mythology, this spirit was defeated and slain by Apollo. Again, it, uh, it was, again, well known. This wasn't sort of a peripheral character. This was sort of a significant uh, entity. Uh, priestesses at Delphi, for instance, were called Puthii, again, they were sort of servants uh, under Python, this Python spirit, spirit of divination, uh, specifically associated with women. Again, not surprisingly here, we have a, a slave girl who is possessed, again, uh, under the influence of the spirit of divination, uh, the spirit of Python, as Luke describes uh, in Acts. Now, some scholars think, and there's actually a division of opinion here, some scholars think that what's going on here is ventriloquism, because there are ancient texts that associate that, that the term, that the Python spirit, with ventriloquism. It's, it's more than that here because Paul specifically addresses the spirit and Luke tells us that the girl had a spirit of divination. So we're, it's not that just that she's a ventriloquist, okay? But I'm just telling you that there is that association in, in a few ancient texts with this. But it's kind of a misnomer because ventriloquism more broadly was thought of in the ancient world as, as to be evidence of possession, uh, some demonic possession or, again, spirit possession by a divine being, whatnot. But again, we get the contextual clues in Acts 16, especially when Paul addresses the Spirit and says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it does, that we're, we're, we're not just dealing with a circus act here or someone who's a clever performer. This was real. So again, there's you, you get both sort of descriptions in antiquity, direct possession, then people sort of trying to fake it. The, the account here in Acts 16 makes pretty clear she wasn't faking it. Okay, she was under the, the authority, under the power of this spirit. And of course, she's the one saying, hey, these guys are servants of the Most High God. Uh, again, very, very clear you know, spiritual understanding on spiritual terms of what is going on here. So again, I, th I think that's something that's very easily missed in the text. Again, unless you're reading in an inter interlinear and look up that term, you basically never see it. So Paul and Silas get thrown in jail again after this account. And then we get to the account of the Philippian jailer in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Uh, not typically what happens in a normal earthquake. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Again, that was a death penalty offense if you let your prisoners escape. Uh, we see this in gospel accounts as well. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And, which is in and of itself is kind of shocking. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. I mean, he knows what's going on, that everybody, all the doors are open, running through the place. You know, he can see that people are unshackled. They're still here. Like, what in the world's going on? And this isn't a normative circumstance, even for an earthquake. He rushes in, and how, how does he parse what's going on right away? He says, Luke says, he brought them out, brought Paul and Silas out of their cell, and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they, Paul and Silas, spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. You know, this sort of implies that, that the prison circumstance here might have been adjoining where the guy actually lived. Or, you know, we're, we're not given all the details. But they speak the word of the Lord to not only him, but to everybody there in the household. And then verse 33, he took them the same hour, the jailer took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So, again, we get an account here. This is one of these so-called household conversion, household baptism situations. Uh, the, typically, the more detail you get, it's very clear that the people who wind up getting baptized have heard the gospel first. And again, the implication is that they've believed because earlier in the book of Acts, that that's the order, repent and be baptized, so on and so forth. Uh, people who are already believers who hadn't been baptized and they get baptized and whatnot. I'm spending a little time on this again, because there are those who Again, mistakenly assume that either, you know, baptism is is sort of, you know, without it, you can't be saved. Uh, Again, we we have instances in the book of Acts where that's not the case very clearly. People are counted believers, but, you know, maybe they've only had the baptism of John or they only had the baptism in one place. They, They were only baptized in the name of Jesus. Again, then you have to have this baptism happen and then the Spirit comes to connect them back to Acts chapter 2 so that everybody present knows that, okay, what's happening here is valid. Okay, what's happening here is part of what was initiated back at Pentecost. So, you know, it becomes sort of a litmus test in in that way in the book of Acts that all of these conversions, whether they're likely or not, Jews and proselytes and Hellenists and all these people that initially the disciples would not have included in the people of God, would not have thought that the gospel was for because the Messiah was Jewish. The Messiah is the son of David. Again, all of these conversions, they're they're sort of, again, validated by the act of baptism and then specifically the, you know, the coming of the Spirit in certain contexts and whatnot. So a lot of these things are happening again so that everybody's clear, both in terms of the real-time events and also the people reading about the history of the early church, that it was the same God and the same message behind all of this. Because it was unusual. To us, you know, it's not unusual to think about non-Jews embracing the, the Jewish Messiah, uh, embracing the gospel. That, you know, back then that would have been, are, we, are you sure? Can that really happen? Is that for real? Is that valid? Is it true? Again, to us, we don't even think about that because most of us are Gentiles, okay? Uh, back then, not the case at all. And so, you know, you, you have these situations where these things all sort of go hand in hand, again, for, for a very specific context and very specific reason, again, to validate the fact that this was all the same thing. This all goes back to the events of Pentecost, the reclaiming of Jews scattered through the nations for centuries, being brought back into the people of God again. You know, dare I say the the finding of the lost tribes, the regathering of Israel. So typically, evangelicals associate these concepts only with the future millennium or only with some future prophetic scheme. Yeah, I'm not saying that that isn't part of it because, hey, people are still being gathered into the kingdom of God today. Okay, so I'm not saying that's not part of the picture, but what I am saying is I got news for you. The regathering of Israel began in the, in the book of Acts. The regathering of Israel and the nations began in the book of Acts. It all started at Pentecost. So to, to put it all future for the sake of some per- scheme of biblical in, uh, you know, interpretation of prophecy is wrong-headed. It's misguided. It misses part of the picture or willfully ignores part of the picture. Again, you, eschatology is, is, is about already but not yet. The kingdom is already here but not yet in its full form. And if you don't get that point, your eschatology doesn't have a prayer of being anywhere close to being accurate. You must get that point. It's not an either or. It's not, oh, you have to either be an amillennialist or a premillennialist. No, you don't. Okay, it's not an either or choice. It's a both and. So deal with that and start rethinking your eschatology. It's already, but not yet, that sort of thing. So again, we, we get these hints of it, but you, you have to read, again, passages like Acts 16, other passages in Acts against the bigger picture, against the meta narrative. What was Pentecost about? Why even have it? And again, earlier up episodes, we've talked at length about this, about connecting it back to the New Covenant, connecting it back to the spirit language of the Old Testament, that the Spirit would come, uh, which even with then was associated with washing. Lo and behold, why do we have baptism as part of the picture? Well, there's an Old Testament precedent for that. Again, all these things are framed and contextualized by Old Testament theology. 
And if, you know, God forbid you're in a, and you're in a context where your church doesn't even hardly know what the Old Testament is, you're really going to miss out. You're not going to be able to frame correctly what you're hearing, uh, what you're reading in the New Testament if you don't have sort of a working knowledge of the, of the bigger picture, the bigger framework from the Old Testament. Because these things are not random. They're not accidental. They're not haphazard uh, in the book of Acts and, and, frankly, anywhere else in the New Testament. They're not that. They're systematic. They're, they're coherent. And they're very decipherable again, within the framework that the Old Testament provides. But again, you, ha- you have to get some of that under your belt to, to really uh, begin to see some of these things and appreciate, to see the patterns. Again, I'm a big believer that patterns are more important than things like word studies. Uh, patterning is really, really, really important because what you have in your Bible, none of it is there by accident, you know, how it's arranged, how it's presented to you. It's deliberate, intelligent, and coherent. Let's, uh, let's move on to Acts 17. We have Paul and Silas. They're going to journey on to Thessalonica. And again, the, the, the passage you know, starts out, again, pretty normative. Paul and Silas show up. Verse 2, Paul went in as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He goes to the synagogue first. Again, the old joke about whenever Paul went to a city, he, he asked where two places were, the synagogue and the jail, because he's going to start at one, he's going to end up in the other. Again, it, 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 is, it is a pattern with him. So they go... To the, to the synagogue, they explain, verse 3, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined, Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. Okay, they, funny how they were all there at the synagogue, and you get these God-fearers there. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Okay, again, Jason was, again, in charge of the synagogue. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. So their reputation had preceded them, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar. Oh, here we go. You know, it's all about Caesar again, saying that there's another king. Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. When they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Well, it it doesn't stop there, obviously. Uh, The the narrative keeps going. And I want to get down to uh, when Paul, again, let's go to to 16, verse 16, Paul gets to Athens. You know, he, let's go back. Well, we'll go up to back, back up to verse 14. The brothers, again, of the city immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there behind. So Paul is going to go on to Athens. Those who conducted Paul, verse 15, brought him as far as Athens. So they give him safe passage out. Again, it's, it's not just that they want a buddy. Okay, they're protecting him. They give Paul safe passage passage to Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So Paul says, thank you. Now I want you to go back and tell Silas and Timothy to come and join me again as soon as possible. Verse 16, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, again, the religious types, and in the marketplace every day with those who who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and said, some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears, I'll bet. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good of them. It's an honest request. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time. I love this editorial comment by Luke. They'd spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And it's, a, it's a bit pejorative on Luke's part, but Athens was known for lots of philosophy. Verse 22, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man 
every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Having determined, here we go, this will sound familiar, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Why? That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For, and then Paul quotes a Greek poet, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And again, that that flips them out. But look at what Paul is saying here. Again, it harkens back, you know, this whole notion about he has made the, the God, the unknown God, the God that you don't really know. Um, that's that's the one I'm here to tell you about. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place. Basically, having determined the regular periods of the history of nations, again, the, the, the times, the ebb and flow of their history, whether they're going to be empires. And it harkens back to the language of Daniel about how God, it's God who sets up kings and who tears them down. It's God who's in control of the progression of the history of all these places and peoples, is what Paul is saying. And then he adds... And he's also determined the boundaries of their dwelling places. Again, hearkening back to the Deuteronomy 32, you know, approach, the, the worldview there uh, that, you know, he's familiar with because, again, he knows his Old Testament. Now, what's interesting here, and this is sort of a, a geek moment for uh, the, the people who are listening who have a little bit of Greek, this statement that Paul makes, why, why does, you know, why should we care if God's in charge of, of you know, the, the history of these nations and the boundaries of their dwelling place? Why should we care that God's really the one in control? And by implication, catch this, not these other gods. The gods that you know aren't the ones in control. It's the God you don't know who's in control. Again, this most high that we've, we, we, you know, we read about in Acts 16, that's the one that's in control. Well, why does that matter? Well, God did this so that these other nations should seek God, verse 27, and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Now, again, the geek moment here is that what you have in verse 27, you have two verb forms for seeking, you know, the seeking and groping, you know, finding their way, you know, toward God. They are in the optative mood. Again, for those of you who have a little Greek, there aren't very many optatives in the New Testament. There are only 70 optatives in the entire New Testament. That's Dan Wallace's count. I mean, if you remember your, your, your Greek a little bit, you know, sorry for the rabbit trail, but for those who have Greek, this is worth pointing out. You have the indicative mood, you have, which is the mood of reality. Again, just the, the way things are, declarative statements. You have the subjunctive, which is uh, the, the mood of sort of expressing a wish or a desire. And then you have the optative. You have the imperative, which is a command. But the optative mood is, is kind of rare in the New Testament. Only 70 places in, in the you know, tens and tens of thousands of words in the New Testament. In general, the optative conveys this idea. It's, a, it's, it's the mood that a Greek writer would use when he wished to portray an action as not only potential, not only something wished for, like the subjunctive, but also possible. So by using an optative, Luke is telegraphing here that, look, you know, what, what God did this with disinheriting the nations and now you know, handing them over to the other gods, the whole Deuteronomy 32 picture. And, you know, he, he does this, you know, the, the goal was never to, to totally get rid of them. Somehow, God leaves the door open so that they would seek the true God. And again, we, we know our Old Testament theology. We know this is part of the Abrahamic covenant. You know, through you, all nations of the earth would be blessed. You know, we know that Israel was supposed to be a kingdom of priests. What are priests? They're mediators. You know, we, we know that, that Israel was supposed to live in such a way that they would attract the nations. The nation's attention would be caught and say, well, what's going on over there? We know that this worked with certain Gentiles in the Old Testament. Okay, but what Luke is telling us here is that God left the door open and it was still possible for a non-Jew, someone who wasn't a physical descendant of Abraham, was still possible for them to seek God. They, they, weren't, they weren't cut off. You know, in other words, God didn't do anything so that they couldn't find him, so that it wasn't possible. Luke is saying it was. 
it was possible for them to be alerted to the God of Israel, what he was like, and to desire him and to seek him and find him. It, 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 could, it, it could have worked. It, it was possible. God wasn't shutting the door entirely as though they had no hope of being saved or in hyper-Calvinistic language, that they were, were incapable of being saved as some sort of quote unquote non elect. Again, and, and listeners will know that I have a quite a different view of election in the Old Testament. I don't, don't need a rabbit trail there. You can go up there and up on the blog and, and find that. But Luke's point here is that, that this is a possibility, and he telegraphs that very clearly by using a very unusual mood in Greek, the optative mood. So it's a grammatical thing that, that just brings out another little aspect to it. Another thing I want to comment here in this regard, when Paul is making this argument, and Luke again is is recording it, we get Paul quoting a foreign text, okay, a, a pagan, you know, source. This is, you know, scholars, you know, classicists have identified this quotation as being from Aratus' uh, poem called The Phenomena. Uh, again, it, it's, it's a pagan source. There's nothing spiritual, nothing, you know, theologically warm about it. It's just, a, you know, just something produced in, in classical Greek literature. So, this isn't the only sort of situation like this. You know, the, the, the famous quotation of Paul to the Corinthians, bad communications, corrupt good manners. Uh, that's from Menander, a Greek poet. Old Testament, you know, we'll, we'll draw things from the Baal cycle of all places about Leviathan, you know, doing, you know, talking about God using the language of texts like that. Enoch is another one. Okay, we know that Jude draws upon Enoch. We know Peter and Jude, conceptually, at least if not a direct quotation, draw upon the book of Enoch as well. So what about the use of these kinds of sources? Now, I I thought this was a good place, again, to rabbit trail a bit, because I often get this question, Mike, you know, should we consider the book of Enoch canonical? That's usually the way it's cast, because people like Enoch. You know, we have Enoch fans out there, okay? They never ask, Mike, should we we consider the Baal cycle canonical? Because they they don't know that, the Old Testament quotes the thing, or any number of books, or you know, some the the wisdom of Amenemope, you know, from Egypt, or something like that. All of these things <laughs> need to be put in the same category. The short answer is no. We don't need to consider Enoch canonical because it's used in the New Testament any more than we would consider the Baal cycle canonical because it's used in the Old Testament. And frankly, the question just doesn't matter. And, and why do I say it that way? These sources were used because they helped a biblical writer. Old or New Testament, articulate something they wanted to articulate well. And if drawing on some source like this helped, they did it because they were familiar with the material. They read it. They understood it. It was part of their culture. It was part of their worldview. They weren't, you know, uninformed hacks. I mean, they, they had a knowledge of what people were reading what people were thinking about, what informed them. And when that was useful, they used it to help them articulate some point of theology in their own writings. Again, in, in the writings that, you know, across the board, you know, you know within the, the believing community, people are going to embrace as inspired. Again, the, the, the books that we now consider canonical. I mean, so on, on one level, the question doesn't even matter. We ought to be familiar with that stuff. Why? Because your, your biblical writers were. And if you were familiar with this stuff, if you read the Apocrypha, if you read Enoch, and if you read other pseudepigraphical books, if you read ancient Near Eastern material, you would be able to follow their thinking better. Uh, I like to use this illustration, you know, again, a modern illustration, I think, that that people who might be new to this idea, this, this notion, can identify with. If you know somebody, let's say, in a Reformed church, a Reformed congregation, whether it's CRC, RCA, or some Presbyterian church or whatever, I mean, the big guy in those circles is John Calvin. So if you or your pastor had read Calvin's Institutes and Calvin's commentary on Romans, it's going to be really hard for you to talk about Romans without having Calvin in your head. Okay, In that respect, or by analogy, biblical writers read lots of stuff. Okay, they read Enoch. They read Second Temple Jewish literature. They read ancient Near Eastern material. So that when they're writing their own stuff, that is in their head. It's floating around there somewhere. And at times, it's useful for articulating a point of theology that they are going to write down that we, again, rightfully cast as inspired canonical material. It doesn't mean the source is you know inspired doesn't mean the thing floating around their head is inspired if we were getting the bible today it might be a movie it might be a youtube video I mean, who knows what it would be but if it had a wide enough circulation that it had value 
explanatory power for something and a biblical writer, you know, again, putting it in modern terms, if, if the Bible was being composed today, if it was useful to articulate a point, that's what they're going to do because that's what they did. So the, the question is, is kind of misguided, but it's also understandable at the same time. So here we have an instance in Acts 17. Again, I just thought be a good place to rabbit trail in that thought because I do get that question a lot. So I, I want to wrap up uh, with Acts 17 sort of at, at that point. I mean, we get this sermon by Paul, uh, the famous sermon there at the Areopagus. And I think, again, the key is, you know, Paul telling them in verse 30, look, the times of ignorance God overlooked, okay? It doesn't, doesn't mean that everybody gets a free pass up until that point, but it, 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 what it means is that they weren't judged, Okay, God is, is allowing them opportunity to repent, opportunity to seek him, because it can work. It's possible. You can find me. Okay, why do I put it that way? Because of what Paul, Paul says in verse 31, right after verse 30. Let's just go back to verse 30 and read it. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because, verse 31, he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And again, that's what sets off the crowd. Some of them believe, some of them reject the message. But again, that, that should be our, our focus. That, that's our context for understanding what Paul's saying here. You know, God, God didn't lower the boom in days past, okay? but now he is bringing things full circle, and it's time to choose. It's time to choose. Because now we have the central figure in this entire plan, this, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, whom God has raised from the dead, who is the Christ. Again, the whole theology of the book of Acts. Now it is time to choose uh, because this is, this is the way God is propelling history at this point. Not only for us, not only for us Jews that are they're standing here in front of you, but for you guys, you Gentiles. Again, the people whose histories, just like ours, and whose boundaries have been allotted by God, by the Most High. It's time to make a choice. So I think that that just helps orient our thinking again in, in what Paul's saying here at the end of Acts 17. Yeah, I really enjoyed the Python Greek. <laughs> I think that's interesting. That's just something that if you're not a scholar of Greek, you're not going to know. Yeah, it has that, that Greco-Roman context. Yeah, you're, not, you're just going to fly right over it. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's very fascinating. I mean, think about it. I mean, for an English translator... ESV uses divination, which, you know, captures the point because if you put the English word Python in there, you're going to, what? You know, what? The, what? That does, just doesn't mean anything, mm -mm. you know, to an English reader. Nope. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I enjoy. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. Well, uh, is there any news about your book? Any updates? Uh, the, uh, we have everything into Amazon. I think this is the way, the best way to put it. There is nothing more that, that I or or Lexum needs to do. We are literally waiting for Amazon to send us an email that says it's all working. So, you know, the books should be out, you know, imminently. Now this, uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, I'm going to actually have to go into work for a little bit because we are, uh, I'm going to meet one of the, the professors that's going to film part of the, uh, the launch video for the books. And the other two guys are, are, are uh, out of state. And so that's in process too. So we're, there's really only two things that, that prevent, you know, having a book. Amazon saying, yep, you know, two thumbs up and we, we got everything right on this end. And then uh, this launch video. I, my, my guess is that once Amazon cuts loose, uh, people will be able to take orders and, and orders that were taken will, you know, go into process before the, the launch video is ever created uh, because Amazon's not waiting for our permission, you know, to, to push their own button. So I just think it'll be a matter of days, you know, it, it, before they we get that email. Once I get that email, I'm going to post it on the blog. And didn't you have something to say about the uh, mobile ed version of learning? Yeah. Greek yeah, I, I should. Uh, the other thing that I'm sort of, you know, have been involved in heavily uh, at work is, is something worth introducing or worth bringing up. Some, some readers or listeners will know about it. And that is the, uh, the mobile ed course, the Lagos mobile ed course, Learn to Use Biblical Greek and Hebrew. Uh, we had created, I was one of the two professors in this course, uh, myself and this, this other guy, whose name is Johnny Cisneros. We had created a version of this like three years ago, but now we've redone the entire thing in, in the, uh, the new mobile ed format, which is just light years beyond uh, the, the the first iteration of this thing. That course is 
now on prepub. It's still on prepub, and it, in theory, it should be up there for a little while yet. But normally, it costs. It's, it's going to cost once it goes off prepub, which is the discount period. It's, it's going to be seven hundred dollars. It's, it's a full course. It's twenty four hours of video and lots of other stuff. But for a short time, people can get it at almost sixty percent off. So right around three hundred dollars, two ninety nine. So I wanted to alert people to that because I do have a lot of people that have asked me by email and a few on the on the blog and the comments about when is Learn to Use going to be you know out? Are you going to redo it? You know all these kind of questions. Well, the answer to that is yeah, we've redone it. It's on prepub. So if you want to learn how to use uh, Greek and Hebrew tools. Again, these are not just tutorials, though. If you want to learn how to use the tools, and here's the important part. If you want to learn grammatical concepts and terminology and why knowing those things has interpretive power and interpretive payoff in your Bible study, if you only read English, okay, there's a way to get to all that information, again, within the software, within the course. If you want to learn how the biblical languages really impact your understanding of scripture and your interpretation. This is ideal for you. There, I, I'm willing to say, again, we're all, you know, I work for Logos, so I'm supposed to be excited about everything they do. I get that. But I'm just telling you, in all honesty, there's nothing on the planet like this. This is a unique product, even for us, uh, even, for, even within the, the scope of the company. Uh, there's, there's nothing like it that will enable English readers to really penetrate English translations in, in, a, in a serious way without having to memorize thousands of words of vocabulary and grammatical forms. You don't have to become a translator. You just have to learn concepts and terms and then have the tools to get at the data and then really have professors like myself or Johnny give you examples on how to think about the data. And it, it's, it's just, there's just nothing like it. I, I just highly recommend it. I don't get a royalty from it, anything like that. So if you're interested in that as a, as a podcast listener, what you need to do is go up to logos.com. That's L-O-G-O-S dot com. And then in the search field in the upper right-hand corner, type in learn to use Greek, Hebrew, and then the words mobile ed, M-O-B-I-L-E, and then just E-D, mobile ed. And that, the first search result that you get from that search will be this course and you will see the discount. You'll, you'll, you'll land right on the discount page for that. So again, people who listen to this podcast should be serious about this kind of Bible study. And so I thought the podcast would be a good place to announce that it, it, it's pre-pub time. You'll never see this discount again and it's well worth the investment. So you're saying I, as a English reader, I would have learned mm-hmm. about Python, for instance. Yes, so yes, that's, you would. You would have. That's perfect. This, the center, the centerpiece of the course is something called the reverse center linear, which not only will display. Uh, it, the English translation is on the top, so anybody who's used an interlinear knows that you know you have like the Greek or the Hebrew on the top, and then the English underneath. But you can't actually read it because it's following Greek or Hebrew word order. It's really a mess with Hebrew because it's right to left. Reversing that process, starting with the English, and with just a right click on an English word, you get a full list of things to search for, one of which would be the word Python. So if you right-clicked on divination, you would see Python as the Greek word underneath that. You could run a search. Where else does that occur? You know, what information can I get about that word in lexicons and in other reports, uh, other other search tools? Uh, Yeah, you would have been able to discover that with something like this. That's that's invaluable. That's a a good deal. Well, Mike, uh, I just want to inform our listeners that our transcripts are going to be late for the next couple of weeks. I guess we're going to let Mr. Tudor go on vacation. <laughs> yeah, we more or less have to I, do that. I guess, I guess we're going to let him. He's, yeah. earned, he's earned it. So yeah, this is, this is voluntary work <laughs> and he has earned it. So, yep. And I also want to remind people that our next show is going to be our third question and answer show. So please email me. Trey Strickland at gmail.com. If you have any questions, we've got a, a pretty good sample of questions already, but uh, please feel free to email me anytime because I save those emails. And so looking forward to that next week. Mike, is there anything else that you would like to discuss for this week? No, no, I, I think that's it. Just you know, keep your eye on the blog. Like I said, when I get the uh, the thumbs up email from Amazon, it's the first place it's going to appear. Any uh, minute now. Is it, is it wrong of me that I keep <laughs> refreshing? Like I go to, I just Why? refresh, refresh. I mean, how many times a day do you <laughs> hit refresh? That's a bit, well. <laughs> Be honest I'll, with I'll, us. <laughs> I'll, I'll check, I'll check my, my work email, you know, even over the weekend, you know, probably half a dozen times, you know, I, I do that. So, but I wouldn't sit there and waste time just refreshing every minute. Uh, you know, just go, go do what you need to do and come back. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, good deal, Mike. I appreciate it. All right. I just want to thank everybody for listening to another episode of the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. 
thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.